Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's always a pleasure to be with you for this next ENS uh, webinar organized by the school based section. The topic today will uh, focus on uh, rare pituitary tumors, and we have again a strong panel of uh, speakers. I will share my screen with you to show you today's program. First, will Diego Mazatenta speak about pituitary adenomas growing inside the cavernous sinus? Then uh, Luigi Cavallo about unconventional pituitary adenomas. Then Julia Kozu about rare pituitary lesions, followed by Mahmoud Messerer, indication of transcranial approach for pituitary tumors, and Henri Schroeder for pituitary carcinoma. Emmanuel Joano has some fortunately to apologize. He cannot be with us today due to a long surgery. But first of all, I would like that we spend a few seconds at the memory of one of our colleagues and friends, who is Professor Boris Krishek, who passed away a few weeks ago. And I would like that we spend a few seconds in memory of him. I know him since a long time, he worked in uh, Tübingen, he worked in Köln, finally in Luxembourg. During his training, he was visiting many de departments. He worked in Toronto, he worked also in Japan, very interested uh, in honoring surgery. Just if you agree to spare a few seconds in memory to him, unfortunately, he leave behind him uh, a family, many friends, many patients, so I will just wait a few seconds in memory to Professor Boris Krishak, please. So now we will start with the first peak, first talk. Thank you, Diego, to be with us this uh, afternoon. And uh, I'm happy to listen about your experience about pituitary I did them as growing inside the cavernous sinus. Please, Diego. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I wish to thank the Aeans uh, for your kind invitation. My talk is uh, uh, pituitary adenoma growing in the cavernous sinus. Uh, the first question is uh, why to go in the cavernous sinus? Because uh, I think that is a, a not easy region, but the experience in the last 20 years demonstrate is impossible and safe to work inside the cavernous science. This is a, a topics of, uh, of our talks. As you know very well, there is a, a different uh, uh, route to, to gain access in cavernous science. As you can see in this picture, the classical route through the Parkinson triangle in craniotomic approach we uh, were described uh, since 1968 uh, from Parkinson and using during uh, in the 90s the, with uh, uh, Dolan's approach. Our philosophy is completely different and using the endoscopic and nasal approach, we access frontally the cavernous sinus, avoiding to cross the cranial nerve, as you can see in this schema. And, uh, the pattern of growing of pituitary adenomas are different. In this case, you can see the tumor growing and displace the internal carotid artery laterally. But there is also a rare case where, in, in where the tumor growing laterally and push medially the internal carotid artery. In this case, it's more difficult to, to access laterally to cavernous sinus to try to remove the pituitary tumors. The last uh, pattern of uh, growing is completely encasement of carotid artery. But as you can see with this point of view, the ventral approach permit the surgeon don't cross the nerve and respecting the one of the law of the endoscopic technique, don't cross the nerve. So there are two main routes to gain access uh, transnasally the cavernous sinus. Medially, as you can see in the schema, and laterally, working laterally to the carotid artery. And uh, why to go into cavernous sinus? Because using the endoscopic approach, the 80% of the cases 
treated in our center, it's enough to use the midline approach. And uh, in only 20 cases uh, uh, percent uh, required the exmoidal transpterygoida extended approach. So when you decide to use the endoscopic technique, it's uh, more uh, physiological to see and to work inside in the middle compartment of the cavernous sinus. How to go in laterally to the cavernous sinus using the etmoidal pterygosphenoidal approach? As you, can, as you know, it's important to perform, first of all, middle turbinectomy to gain access more laterally than standard approach with the transphenoidal route. After the, the etmoidotomy, it's enough to drilling out the, drill, the pterygoid process to enlarge the uh, surgical corridor. And as you can see in this uh, anatomical dissection, your midline of uh, your surgical uh, field is completely laterally to the pituitary gland. In this uh, short clip, you can see in real life uh, the approach. And you can see after the middle turbinectomy, the surgeon performed the etmoidotomy. You are in the right nasal fossa. In the left side, you can see the nasal septum. We prepare the nasal septal fat. It's not needed always necessary to prepare this nasal septal fat. Uh, Sorry, you can stop your microphone. Ciao. Okay, and uh, we perform uh, the drilling of the pterygoid process. After the sphenoidotomy, you can see this is the, your mid anatomical midline. This is the optocarotid resist in the right side, bulging of the internal carotid, pituitary gland, climal indentation. The surgeon enlarge uh, widely as possible the floor of sphenoidal sinus, drilling the pterygoid process, exposing more laterally to the normal view of transphenoidal midline approach. You can see the optic carotid receives, optic nerve, carotid artery, and this is the ventral window in front of cavernous sinus. The OR setting are more complex than normal standard approach. In our center, in case, in selected cases, we use the intraoperative monitoring of the, of the nerve cranial nerves. We use double screen for the first and assistant operator, and it's very useful the narrow navigation, the drill like speed, the shiver, and also the microprobe Doppler uh, probe. This is the old classification of CNOSP. The new classification of CNOSP uh, uh, using the uh, pre op MRI, you can see two different grade three, the grade A and the grade B. As you can see, the location of invasion of tumor is completely different. In grade A, the location is between the intercarotid, intercavernous tract of uh, carotid artery, and in grade B is inferior to intracavernous uh, carotid artery tract. It's more important to select the, these two different types because in case the, the grade zero, one, two, and A, three A, is possible to work inside the cavernous sinus using the midline approach. In case of a three B and four, is need to control more laterally using the extended approach. As you can see in this case, this is a, a grade one intraoperative uh, grading of uh, inversion of cavernous sinus. As you can see, after adenomectomy, you can see in the uh, right side the pituitary gland displaced and the cavernous sinus of the right side covered by the medial wall of cavernous sinus. In this case, there is only compression of uh, uh, cavernous sinus without invasion. In this case, we can see neuroradiological, a great A with the invasion of cavernous sinus preoperatively. But as you can see in this clip, it's the same case intraoperatively. The, the surgeon performed the uh, etmedectomy. Uh, the tumor removal starts with removing the middle part, and after the surgeon starts with removing the lateral compartment of invasion of cavernous sinus. 
we use in the older and we dissect with two hands technique. As you can see, this is the pseudo capsule of tumor and posteriorly you can see the medial wall of cavernous sinus compressed and not invaded by the tumor. In this case, there is no invasion uh, of cavernous sinus as described by neuroradiological uh, workup, but only compression. And you can see the, caver the carotid artery and the medial wall of uh, cavernous sinus without any venous bleeding because it's only compressed. This is a, a, a early an MRI postoperatively. This is another case. This is a, a three A's of compression of the cavernous sinus, but during the expansion, in, during the procedure, you can see very well, this is a grade two following the Knopf classification. You can see the pituitary gland, this is the midline. This is the uh, medial wall of cavernous sinus, and you can see the hole created by the tumor growing and enlarge the medial wall of cavernous sinus and the component of tumor invading the cavernous sinus. Neuroradiologically, it's only a grade two, but after surgical inspection, you know very well there is a real invasion of cavernous sinus. This is a great tree with complete invasion of cavernous sinus. This is the, uh, you can see in coronal view, the pituitary gland, pituitary salt, a complete invasion of cavernous sinus on the left side. The tumor, start, the tumor removal starts in the midline. We remove the tumor with the two hands technique. This is the pituitary gland. You can see the carotid artery. We are in front of uh, carotid artery in the left side. We continue the tumor moving by aspirator and correct. This is the intracavernous sinus tract of uh, internal carotid artery. This is the medial compartment of cavernous sinus, as you can see, and this is the lateral compartment. With the angle endoscope, it's possible to control the medial compartment. As you can see, this is the medial wall of cavernous sinus when run and bladed the cranial nerve in cavernous sinus. This is the postoperative MRI. As you can see, this is the extension of tumor removal, preserving the pituitary gland in the east cell. Grade four is complete invasion in casement of cavernous sinus. This is a, a hold clip that is very didactic to describe the double corridors because this is the extreme lateral view, as you can see the projection in, uh, in the square blue, the projection of the internal carotid artery covered by the caver of the dura madre of cavernous sinus midline approach and the lateral approach. And this is, is a clip. We are very far lateral approach and it is possible to work using and two different corridors laterally and medially of internal carotid artery. And this is was the results post op. Obviously, this is a GH circuit in pituitary adenomas. The surgery is not performed to allow a cure of passion, but permit a maximum resection to start after with the medical therapy, and in the second level, radiotherapy is needed. As you can see in this table, in this schema, this is the percentage of gross total uh, resection using the endoscopic approach. As you can see, the big difference in case of CNOS 1, 2, and 3A, where the gross total uh, resection was achieved almost 70%, but decreased significantly in case of CNOS 3B and 4. And this is most important to planning the surgery in a multidisciplinary approach, because the surgery is not enough to control or cure the patient in this case. 
It's always possible not. The answer is not. As you can see in this image, this is a GHPG adenomas. We start to remove with the middle component. We check before, as you can see, with the microbe Doppler, the correct position and the real position of an internal carotid artery. And after, we start with opening the lateral windows of cavernous sinus. The consist of the tumor in the middle compartment was very soft. But when we try to remove the lateral compartment of cavernous sinus, we uh, check a very firm tumor. As you can see, it was not possible to use the curette and the aspirator. And we decided immediately to stop the procedure. This is what the results. And we used, this is a GH secondary epithelioma, the medical therapy to control the acromegaly, the pathology of passion. The take home message is the consistency of tumor is crucial to allow a better surgical results. In case of the film tumor, stop the procedure to avoid a bigger complicance. Our experience is more than 400 procedures. This is a old paper published. I would like to show you the, uh, uh, the our gross total resection in secreting and non secreting pituitary adenomas. But we are also studying which are the uh, most uh, important uh, factors to, uh, to predict the results of surgery. The grading of invasion is more important. For the grading more than 3B, it's more difficult to allow a gross total resection. History of previous surgical radiation treatment is a big problem from reduced surgery. And also, the most important, one of the most important is consistency of tumor, because in case of firm tumor, it's very difficult. In fact, we don't use this approach, for example, in tumor like meningiomas. The complication, the best, com the worst complication is the internal carotid artery. In our experience, uh, we observed only one case. It was occurred in one of the first 20 procedures more than 20 years ago, using in, at that time the monopolar coagulation. And uh, the, to treat in uh, uh, this case, it's mandatory to work inside the in, uh, neurosurgical department, where is the endovascular unit to control and fix this dramatic damage of internal carotid artery. There is a debate to do or not to do the balloon test. The balloon test, this is a, a, a paper published by the Pizza Group. The balloon test is not a safe procedure and is described a 1.5% of complication, overall of complication. In our experience in pituitary adenomas with correct indication, we observe only 0.2%. So we inform the patient always this dramatic complication. But in our experience with correct indication, the percentage of damage of internal carotid artery is less than balloon test. And this is a one of the information we give to our patient. In conclusion, the endoscopic endonasal surgery is a, a minimally invasive approach and uh, it could be useful in cavernous sinus. Multidisciplinary treatment and uh, uh, correct indication is uh, crucial to allow the best results. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, you have an incredible experience of such lesions. Uh, I will suggest that uh, we concentrate the question at the end of the webinar, if you agree. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will move to Luigi Cavallo Talks. Uh, hello, Luigi. Nice to be uh, with you again with us uh, this afternoon. And uh, I will again surely appreciate your talk uh, on conventional pituitary adenomas. I'm sure that you will show us uh, many different things. Okay, Please. thank you. Uh, just let me share the screen. And uh, 
Okay. Do you see the screen? Not yet. We see a black screen. Just before we saw uh, your folder. Now. No, I see your folder. Yes. And the black screen. Maybe you have to start first your PowerPoint in full mode. Have, have the PowerPoint presentation ready and click directly on that. Okay. But please let me, I will try to close first. Okay, now I open again. Please. Have it opened and then share the screen by clicking on the, on the green button. Yeah. Otherwise, if you would like that, you have a few seconds to solve this solution. We can shift to the talk of uh, Julia Kuzu in the in the meantime, and uh, we come back to you just after. Mm -hmm. you well, it works. It's yeah. perfect. It works. Good. Up to you, Luigi. Okay, but I cannot go in a full mode. Okay, so yes, it is. Uh, inconvenient. So let's start. Um, so first point. Uh, what we mean when we say conventional and unconventional pituitary tumors. So let's start to say what we mean for conventional pituitary adenoma. So these are the typical conventional pituitary tumor that we usually see in a routine case, as a routine case. You see from small into a granular intracellular pituitary adenoma to large intrasupracellular lesion, just uh, compressing above uh, the diaphragm cell and then uh, the chiasma, regular uh, shape. And um, there is uh, one common thing in all these uh, pituitary tumor. All of these tumor grow below the level of diaphragm cell. They can uh, push upward the diaphragm, um, but uh, they do not uh, violate the subarachnoid uh, uh, space. So for this kind of uh, tumor, the approach is uh, quite straightforward. Uh, it's um, not, I would say not easy, but uh, what uh, happens is that you have just to debark from inside this tumor uh, with suction, with curette, and uh, at the end, what you will see, it's the prolapse of uh, the diaphragm uh, inside the cell system. When you have a quite large tumor, you have to elevate the diaphragm to see if there is uh, any remnant of the tumor uh, in between the folds of the cistern, but uh, at the end, you can achieve quite a, a good and also uh, fast tumor removal. So this is another case uh, very similar, or this one, even with, with a small irregular shape of uh, uh, the, the supracellular component, but anyway, you can, uh, walk below the level of diaphragm, you can avoid the uh, uh, CSF leak. So um, the uh, result, uh, especially on visual function, but also on pituitary function are, are, are quite good. So uh, these, uh, of course, uh, with the endoscope uh, can be performed uh, without uh, removing any other structures uh, and uh, um, you can take benefit of the use of the endoscope uh, also in this uh, larger uh, intrasupracellular pituitary tumor because you can navigate inside the cell and around the cistern. And Diego Mazzadenda showed us also through the medial wall uh, inside uh, the cavernous sinus. So uh, usually uh, this is a not uh, a complex uh, um, uh, surgery, but different is the situation when you have to deal with uh, this unconventional pituitary tumor. So not necessarily very large or big tumor, but uh, you see the shape is not so regular. You see some of these cases have been already operated uh, one or more time uh, transphenoidally or even transcranially. The shape, the pattern of growth is irregular. Uh, sometimes they involve not only the cavernous sinus, but also 
neurovascular structure. They can grow even inside the drift ventricle with uh, some irregular shape uh, also on the anterior cranial base. So most of these case, especially in the past, were considered to transcranial surgery because the high risk of a complication to remove this kind of tumor and the nasal. So the key point of this uh, tumor is that uh, quite often they have dumbbell-shaped pericellar extension. They can have an encasement of a critical neurovascular structure. And most of the time, uh, they cause a violation of the subarachnoidal space. So using the extended supracellar approach, we can uh, overcome this uh, limitation. And uh, this is something that started even uh, with the microsurgical uh, era, uh, with the microscope, with the microsurgical transpenoid approach at the time of uh, Martin Weiss or uh, Ed Laws. Uh, but of course, the view you can have with the microscope through the nose is quite uh, uh, limited. So uh, what we propose is a sort of extra capsular uh, dissection. So you can use a double corridor. You can uh, debug the tumor from inside the cell. And when you don't have the prolapse of the cistern because it is attached to some uh, neurovascular structure, you can go extra capsularly. And this is quite useful, especially in case of uh, recurrent tumor to dissect the diaphragm from the vessel of nerves. And in this way, you can free these structures. This is the typical example, a sunglass-shaped pituitary adenoma. You see narrow neck. You can take benefit of the opening of the planum, because in this way, you see you can remove this part of the tumor that uh, otherwise uh, would not be possible to remove uh, uh, through a standard uh, transpenoidal route. You see a uh, very rare configuration of the tumor. The tumor was growing between the chiasma, pushing anteriorly the atom complex, very rare shape of, of tumor. And you see that at the end, without touching the brain, you can see the same shape of uh, uh, the tumor after surgery, respecting the pituitary circle and gland. Things become more complex when you have the tumors like this one with the really regular shape of the supracellar component with the some uh, encasement on a vascular structure. And in this case, the principles are the same. We start uh, as a conventional pituitary uh, tumor surgery with the bark, uh, the intracellular uh, part of the tumor. Then you start to see that the tumor uh, is quite fibrotic, uh, not easy to remove, not the center of the supracellar system. We try with suction so that we move uh, over the planum, opening the dura, and then we start to dissect from the chiasm and optic nerve the supracellar part of the tumor. As you can see, this tumor, pituitary tumor, are more bleeding than uh, meningioma or especially craniopharyngioma. So uh, you have to be uh, to try to be radical in this uh, kind of tumor because uh, if you give some uh, remnant of the capsule, you risk to have some uh, delayed uh, bleeding and uh, hematoma of, uh, from this tumor. So you have, uh, you see at the end of tumor removal, the stalk with the pituitary gland, accurate hemostasis, you see here carotid bifurcation. And at the end, the three F technique uh, with the large piece of fat to see the defect uh, covered by, by the nasoceptal uh, flap. And that's the post op MRI. You see the piece of fat in the uh, position in the cell, a cell remnant in the posterior cavernous sinus. But you see some fat already resolved, but with the good tumor removal. And then we have some uh, more rare tumor growing also inside the third ventricle, like uh, this one. You see quite normal pituitary tumor, except for this part. But you cannot leave this part if you start to remove this tumor. For, uh, because, as I said, there is an increased risk of bleeding from residual tumor. 
So you debug from inside and then you start uh, to dissect the tumor capture from outside. Not easy to recognize neurovascular structure in large tumor because uh, um, the structure are distorted. And this is the part of tumor growing in between the eye coma and the chias matrulamina terminalis. You see there. So this part of tumor uh, was removed. And here is a blood clot inside the third ventricle. And this is a uh, at the end, a view inside the third ventricle, and after tumor removal, you see the, the diaphragm was coagulated and the tumor was removed again, the piece of fat inside the cell. This is quite a not recent case, but just to show that sometimes they really grow completely inside the third ventricular cavity. The, the quality is not so good, but just to show you that when you start to remove uh, this tumor inside the third ventricle, you have to remove all the pieces of tumor along the wall of the ventricle. If you leave this tumor uh, behind, you risk to have uh, a bleeding from this tumor inside. So you need to use longer instrument, at least a 15 centimeter uh, curved cannula, otherwise you will not reach the foramen or more through the nose. But this is the view at the end. You see, you have to check all the wall and then you close with the fat. We are not using any more of this dura substitute, uh, but this is the, the control. Of course, this patient had the eye improvement of uh, the amyanopia and also partial hypopit. Very rarely when the endonasal root is not enough, um, we can combine the endonasal root with the transcranial root. And the good option is the supraorbital root because uh, the, the, the setup uh, and the position of the patient uh, is, uh, uh, is helping for combining the approach. So when we have tumor growing also above the surface of the nerve, we use a double endoscopic tile. You see the opening we made from below. We open all the and fenestrate the cystic uh, component uh, and the part of the tumor growing above. This patient has been already operated twice, irradiated already. So it's quite risky to do any kind of fraction from above and below. You see, we try to remove as much as possible. This instrument comes from above, this from below, you see. Uh, we uh, reconstruct uh, in this case with some dura substitute, but at the end, uh, the result, of course, we left some remnant around the nerve, but uh, it was satisfactory. So, what is the percentage of this unconventional tumor? As you can see, it's quite rare, no more than five, seven percent, as compared to conventional pituitary tumor. So, means that this means that. Uh, you absolutely do not need any extended approach for pituitary surgery in 95% of the cases. But you have to consider that there is a, this a, a quite rare evidence um, in which you may need to use extended approach. And, you, and if you look uh, around 30 patients, they come from conventional adenoma. That means they are uh, regrow or recurrence of patients that have been already operated before with a standard approach. And also, if you look at the complication of this uh, kind of unconventional pituitary tumor, of course, are uh, higher, but uh, of course, they have to be compared with the transcranial series because uh, you work uh, through the subarachnoid space, you manipulate uh, vessel, you uh, and nerves, you create a larger uh, intradural corridor. So higher risk of CSF leak, but also some vasospasm. You see, for example, this case, of course, it's another recurrent case, already operated uh, uh, transphenadally before. We removed the tumor, we left maybe too much capsule, and this patient had some uh, initial uh, any paresis, uh, we suddenly do angiography. We, in uh, maybe infusion of uh, nimodipine, 
we have to do this uh, two or three times, but at the end, uh, you see, we were able uh, to have a normal uh, um, and geography, uh, the tumor removal was quite good. Uh, patient uh, recovered completely from uh, uh, the um, hemiparesis, but you see that uh, on MRI we had, of course, some, some stroke. So in conclusion, some consideration, uh, uh, especially for the instrumentation, you need, uh, when you do extended approach through the nose, uh, you need a dedicated instrument and dedicated setup. Uh, especially you need a longer instrument when you have to work in, uh, in deep uh, uh, corridor. And uh, I think that uh, that's all. I stop to share. Thank you so much, Luigi. It was uh, very interesting uh, as usual. Indeed, uh, unconventional lesions with uh, very low frequency, but you have operated so, ma so many pituitary tumors that uh, you have a great experience of such uh, unconventional lesions. I have a few questions maybe for the end of uh, the webinar, if you agree or so. It uh, allow us to move to the talk of uh, Julia Kozu on uh, rapid Twitter with tumors. Please, Julia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So thank you for the invitation. Okay. With pleasure, please. Thank you. I will talk about uh, rare pituitary lesions. So first of all, uh, which tumor can be defined as rare? We have to remind that according to the European Union definition, rare tumors are defined as tumors that have an annual incidence of less than six per 100,000 persons. So the prevalence of um, pituitary adenomas is more than 10 times higher than that, in, than that incidence. So what are the rare pituitary tumors? We uh, perform a retrospective analysis of our surgical series of uh, cellular lesions that were treated through transpenoidal surgeries. And we found that uh, besides some cases of craniopharyngiomas and rectus cleft cyst, we found uh, some lesions that were misdiagnosed initially for pituitary adenomas and that were instead other entities. So we found more or less 5% of 15 lesions of our surgical series corresponding to these uh, lesions that were in part uh, tumor lesions. So um, aggressive lesions such as tumor uh, pituitary metastasis, uh, lymphomas, uh, uh, or germ cell tumors, and other that were instead indolent lesions, such as uh, pituitomas, germ cell tumors, or ganglocytoma. Some of them were also non-neoplastic, such as hypophysitis and uh, one case of hyperplasia. So the diagnosis can um, also not be so straightforward sometimes, and I would like to share our experience with you through the illustration of some cases. We had this patient uh, that was a 68 years old lady that presented with an isolated diabetes insipidus. Um, and uh, DMR showed this um, uh, lesion that was unusual for a, a classical pituitary adenoma with a, a cellular component and a supracellular component with also a thickening of the stock and a possible invasion of the right cavernous sinus. Particularly in T1 weighted DMRI, the uh, posterior bright spot that is in general present was not identifiable, so there was uh, possibly an invasion of the uh, posterior pituitary lobe. The patient was also known for a, a an history of lung adenocarcinoma. And surprisingly, after that, we performed a transpenoidal surgery. The pathology told us that it was a, a secondary localization of her cancer. So you have to keep in mind that when you have oncology patients, they can have in um, till 30% of cases, a secondary localization at the pituitary gland that can also be isolated. In general, these metastases are silent, but when they are symptomatic, they, they manifest more, more commonly as uh, a diabetes insipidus. 
The prognosis is in general bad as the overall survival is less than one year and the treatment is generally palliative as the complete removal can often be unfeasible and also the radiotherapy or chemotherapy protocols uh, don't affect uh, the survival. This was another case of a 60 years old lady that presented with a uh, right oculomotor palsy that was complete and she also had a panhypopituitarism with uh, diabetes insipidus. So again, a clinical presentation that was not typical for a pituitary adenoma and the MR showed this cellar lesion with a small supracellular extension and instead a large extension, large invasion of the right cavernous sinus. So here the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus was pushed laterally while the roof was pushed upward and the um, internal carotid artery was completely encased. Again, we went for a transphenoidal biopsy and the pathology told us that uh, it was a primary localiz localization of a, a pituitary lymphoma. This uh, alternative diagnosis should be keep, kept in mind for patients with systemic lymphoma where uh, more or less one fourth of patients can be as, can have also an involvement of the pituitary gland. Uh, instead, the primary involvement of the pituitary gland from, a, uh, lymph, from an isolated lymphoma is very rare. This, year, this is more commonly in uh, immunodeficient um, people and uh, more or less 80% of patients can present with a cranial nerve deficit, while more than 60% of cases can have a, a complete hypopituitarism. Again, the prognosis is bad, so you have to remind that um, the main role of surgery is to obtain a sample for having a diagnosis and they have a survival of more or less one year without a clear impact on that from radiotherapy and chemotherapy protocols. This was instead a young lady, 38 years old, that presented with the visual deficits, a bitemporal amenopia, and a panhypopituitarism with diabetes insipidus. Again, the MR was atypical for a, a classical pituitary adenoma. So you can see a, a cellar component with a supracellar extension, uh, maybe also an invasion of the uh, subarachnoidal space, um, and an extension towards the uh, third ventricle. We went again for a transphenoidal surgery and the pathology told us that it was not a pituitary adenoma, but instead a germinoma. So uh, the localization of germ cell tumors in the cell uh, remain rare. We have always to search for a secondary localization uh, in the penile gland or in the uh, paraventricular region. And the germinoma is of course the most frequent uh, subtype, but also other um, histological subtypes can uh, present. In general, patients present with diabetes insipidus because of the localization in the posterior globe of the pituitary. And then there are some genetic conditions that we have to know that are associated with a higher incidence of germ cell uh, tumors. Uh, for this specific kind of uh, population, we have to remind that they are in general radiosensitive and in particular germinomas are associated with a long-term survival. Uh, this was a 77 years old man instead that presented with a classical presentation of a pituitary apoplexy with a thunderclap headache and panhypopituitarism. At that time, he had no visual deficit and the MR showed this cellar lesion with uh, a supracellar extension and the displacement of the optic eyes with a peripheral, peripheral contrast enhancement and a central necrotic core. At the time, he started with a conservative treatment, but six weeks after, uh, he came back to the ER with uh, to the emergency department with a bitemporal hemianopia. At that moment, we performed a transphenoidal surgery with a, a good resection. So uh, here you can see the normal pituitary that is remaining, but we had a, a surprise as the uh, pathological diagnosis was that of a, a pituitoma uh, that. Um, had uh, showed uh, an apoplexy. 
So PTC, the PTC tumma belongs to low-grade neoplasm that derives from the posterior pituitary, and this subcategory includes other subtypes that were before classified as spindle cell oncocytomas, granular cell tumors, and cellar hepanemomas. They are rare as they represent less than 1% of cellar tumors, and they are in general indolent with a, low, with a slow growth but they can sometimes present uh, some episodic uh, uh, hemorrhages or uh, apoplexy. A gross total resection is recommended in these cases as the uh, use of radiotherapy such as gamma knife uh, has not a precise role in these cases. This was um, a young lady, 46 years old, that presented with a classical uh, presentation of acromegaly. This diagnosis was also confirmed by blood tests, and the MR showed this uh, lesion lateralized on the right side of the, of the cella with the pituitary gland that was instead pushed on the left. So we went for a transpenoidal surgery. A complete resection was possible, and the pathology told us that it wasn't a simple GH secreting adenomas, but it was uh, instead coupled with a ganglocytoma. The combination of a cellar ganglocytoma with a pituitary uh, adenoma was described uh, in more or less 130 cases in literature, and in more than 80% of cases, these cellular ganglocytomas are associated with uh, some kind of adenomas, more frequently with mixed GH and PRL secreting adenomas. Um, they can present a more extensive infiltration of the cavernous sinus and sometimes of the subarachnoidal space in 40% of cases, and a complete resection was possible in more or less 60% of cases. It was also hypothesized that uh, the coexistence of a cellar ganglocytoma with a, a pituitary adenomas could be associated with a higher aggressiveness uh, of pituitary adenomas, maybe uh, because of some stimulating factors that are secreted by the ganglocytoma itself. This last case was again a young lady, uh, 38 years old, that presented with visual deficits and a complete pan hypopituitarism. Uh, we performed a DMA, this MR that showed uh, this lesion of the cell with a small supracellar extension uh, with the stock that was remaining more or less on the midline, and it wasn't possible to identify the normal pituitary. We performed the surgery and the pathologist told us that it wasn't a pituitary adenoma, but instead a, a hypophysitis, an EGG4 hypophysitis. So the patient was later, later diagnosed for an autoimmune disorder also associated. So what do you have to keep in mind about hypophysitis? Um, they can be encountered in patients with uh, immunotherapy or with autoimmune systemic disorders and also in patients with pregnancies. This is uh, another risk factor. They present most commonly with a pan hypopituitarism in 80% of cases, while the, uh, the um, presentation with an isolated diabetes insipidus is rare. So what are the clues that can orient uh, your uh, diagnosis in front of this atypical lesion? Uh, you have to analyze carefully the clinical presentation of the patient. Uh, an isolated diabetes insipidus is not typical for a pituitary adenoma. So when you have that, you have to think about a lesion that could involve directly the posterior pituitary lobe, such as a pituitary metastasy, a lymphoma, a germinoma, or a, a pituitoma. And then the other important factor to consider is the medical history of your patient. For instance, if you have a pregnant patient, you have always to suspect uh, before everything and hyperplasia or a hypophysitis, uh, and you have to keep in mind that the surgery is not necessary for this kind of condition. And then if you have an oncological patient or a patient under immunotherapy uh, or that is immunosuppressed, you have to think about the possibility of developing a, a pituitary lymphoma, a pituitary metastasis, or also a hypophysitis. So in conclusion, you have to keep in mind that rare pituitary lesions represent five to 10% of surgical series. 
that if you have a patient that has an isolated diabetes insipidus that presents an oncological history or that is pregnant, you should suspect a, a lesion that is not a classical pituitary adenoma if the radiological characteristic or the clinical characteristic are not typical then the pathological diagnosis remain the mainstay to uh, establish a correct diagnosis and then uh, to make a future plan of treatment for your patient. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for this uh, nice overview of the differential diagnosis that we must think about when uh, we are dealing with uh, a pituitary tumor. Thank you. So we remain in Lausanne and uh, it's now Mahmoud Messera, we will discuss with us the indications for the transcranial approach. Surely it will be very interesting again. Please, Mahmoud, up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for this invitation and this uh, excellent uh, webinar. I will talk about uh, indication of transcranial approach for pituitary uh, adenomas. When we talk about uh, surgical approach to pituitary tumors, we have two surgical options, transfinoidal approach or transcranial approach. Transfinoidal approach, to be clear, is uh, the majority of the indication and the rate is more than 96%. However, transcranial approach is a rare indication and it represents less than 4% of all indication to pituitary uh, tumors. When we analyze uh, uh, the literature in the last uh, 20 years, we can see in this uh, literature the classical uh, contraindication of transfinoidal approach. Giant pituitary adenomas, inaccessible supraserial extension, as you can see here, posterior or anterior, dumbbell-shaped adenoma, paraserial extension, or sphenoid sinus tip concha. But nowadays, and uh, I think you agree with me, all this uh, contraindication are a good indication for transfinoidal surgery. Thanks to the endoscope, to the extended approach, we can reach generally different supraserial extension, posterior, anterior. Uh, dumbbell shaped tumor is not uh, a contraindication now and uh, seen with the sinus tip control, we can address this problem by using the neural navigation. I want to share with you this case uh, operated many years ago in uh, another institution. This is the post-operative MRI. Unfortunately, I don't have the pre-operative MRI. And in this post-operative MRI, we can see uh, the residue inside the sphenoid sinus uh, particularly in the lateral recess of the sphenoid sinus, uh, residue also in the cellar space and in the supracellar space. Seven years later, the, uh, the residual tumor uh, increased and the patient was operated in the same surgery by transphenoidal surgery using the endoscope. This is the post-operative MRI. Donc, uh, the result is not uh, satisfied. There is a residue inside the sphenoid sinus and also in the supracellar space. I saw this patient uh, two months uh, ago. The residue was uh, increased. There is a different part, uh, irregular uh, shape. And I, uh, I approached this uh, patient uh, using extended approach. First of all, I, uh, I resect the cellar and uh, the sphenoid part by uh, uh, opening uh, widely the sphenoid sinus. After that, uh, it's very important to do transtubercular approach. This is the dura, the diaphragm. Opening the diaphragm until the pituitary stalk. I think it's important to see the pituitary stalk to preserve it. This is the second part of the tumor, medial of the uh, supraclinoid uh, uh, ACA, uh, uh, the uh, supraclinoid portion. We remove Je ne peux pas vous aider à faire cela sur votre Mac. Et, uh, th this is the 
ACA and the optic nerve. And finally, I resect the last piece lateral to the uh, third ventricle with uh, respecting the pituitary stalk. This is the post-operative MRI. Uh, uh, the result is good without uh, uh, residue. So it's very important to analyze the image and uh, to, uh, to do the best approach for this uh, irregular and for this uh, difficult uh, pituitary adenoma. What about giant adenoma? When we talk about giant adenoma, it's not synonym of transcranial approach. This is an excellent uh, example of giant pituitary adenoma. The, uh, the height of the tumor is more than four uh, centimeter. And uh, this is an excellent indication of transphenoidal approach. So which giant pituitary adenoma should be operated by transcranial approach? When you have specially irregular multinodular shaped tumor, extension of the tumor lateral to the supraclinoid internal carotid artery in the temporal fossa, or if you have an encasement of uh, the subarachnoid artery, specially the supraclinoid ACA or the anterior carotid artery. This is an example of combined surgery. This patient has a giant pituitary adenoma with an encasement of uh, the supra with ACA, anterior carotid artery uh, in the temporal fossa and lateral to the third ventricle. We addressed this first part of the tumor using FTUZ craniotomy. In the second part, we take out the sphenoid and the cellar part. The tumor was classified in 2B according to Truyas classification. Uh, why? Uh, that's why I decided to treat the residue inside the, the right cavernous sinus by gamma knife. This is the MRI three years after follow-up. There is no residue inside the cellar or the supracellular space, and the residue remain stable inside the, the right cavernous sinus. The second indication of transcranial approach, I think, is when you have an apoplexy of residual tumor after transphenoidal surgery. This is an example of patient with a GH microadenoma, dumbbell-shaped tumor. When you see here in T2-weighted image, the signal is isosignal. So when you have isosignal or uh, hyposignal in T2, you can predict the tumor is hard. I operated this patient by transphenoidal surgery. Unfortunately, uh, the resection wasn't good. The tumor was very hard. And immediately post-operatively, the patient had an important decrease of left visual acuity. So I decided to operate in emergency surgery by transcranial approach with the uh, decompression of uh, optic pathway. This is the post-operative uh, MRI. I think in this kind of situation, if you go, uh, if you come back by transphenoidal uh, surgery, the result is not very satisfied and the decompression of the optic pathway also is not good. So I prefer go by transcranial approach uh, in this kind uh, of uh, situation. It's a very rare situation, but it can be uh, happens. Uh, the third indication is when you have a non-accessible residue after transphenoidal surgery, uh, especially in functioning pituitary uh, adenoma. This is an example of GH macroadenoma inviting the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is the postoperative MRI after transphenoidal surgery, but uh, the, uh, when we see here in uh, axial uh, plane, there is a small residue uh, superior to the anterior clinoid process between the optic nerve and uh, the uh, roof of the, uh, the left cavernous sinus. So we have two options, medical treatment or surgical treatment. Uh, gamma knife is not possible because uh, the, the tumor is uh, too uh, close to the optic uh, nerve. So I decided to operate this patient by transcranial approach. 
I did a standard craniotomy, uh, frontoperitoneal uh, craniotomy. Uh, this is the sphenoorbital band. I cut the sphenoorbital band. I opened the uh, superior uh, orbital fissure. I identify the anterior clinoid process. This is the anterior clinoid process here. After removing the, uh, the clinoid, we can identify the tumor. The tumor is between the optic nerve. The optic nerve is here. And this is the third nerve. You can stimulate to identify the third nerve. And this is the tumor in the Dolange triangle. We can do a good resection and the patient is uh, cured. Another rare indication uh, of transcranial approach is ectopic pituitary adenoma, especially when the ectopic adenoma is located lateral to the pituitary stall. I prefer transcranial approach because I can preserve the pituitary gland. It's not necessary to displace or to transposite the pituitary gland and the dissection uh, between the tumor and the pituitary stalk is easier by transcranial approach. Another rare, very rare condition is kissing carotid, particularly in GH adenoma. Uh, in reality, uh, this kind of uh, anatomic situation is not a contraindication of transfinoidal approach. We can do transfinoidal approach, we can lateralize both uh, carotids, but generally we can have uh, uh, a, uh, a small uh, surgical corridor and I prefer a transcranial approach if it's not possible to uh, lateralize the carotid. So to conclude, uh, transcranial approach remains a rare indication in the treatment of pituitary adenoma. The best indication uh, are when you have a giant multilobulated adenoma with an enhancement of uh, ACA or uh, on anterior carotid artery. When you have apoplexy of residual tumor uh, after uh, difficult uh, transphenoidal surgery, non-accessible residue after transphenoidal surgery, especially for functioning pituitary adenoma, or very rare situation like ectopic uh, uh, adenoma or kissing carotid. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. You highlighted how it is important to handle all the approaches to deal with a pituitary tumor. Of course, you master the transfinidal approach, but also you have in your hands the transcranial one. So very important to have all the options in uh, the possibilities to offer to the patients. Thank you. Then we move for the final talk of uh, Henri Schroeder about a rare condition, a rare pathology, a carcinoma of the pituitary. So Henri, are you with us? If you can stop to share your screen, Mahmoud, maybe. Yeah, hello, Michele. Thanks hello, again hello. for the invitation. Great pleasure to be with you. My pleasure. I want to talk a little bit about pituitary carcinomas. It's very rare, fortunately. So what is a pituitary carcinoma? It's definitely a pituitary adenoma, which is aggressive, invasive, and it should have a metastasis, a distance metastasis. This is a definition. So you cannot distinguish between uh, aggressive pituitary adenoma and a carcinoma if you do not have a metastasis. And it usually comes a little bit later in life between the fifth and sixth decades and males and females are equally involved. There's a nice um, review article from 2004 published by Codewell's group and it shows that it's really a rare lesion it is about 0.1 or 0.2% of all pituitary tumors. At that time, 140 cases were reported in the English literature. And interestingly, the majority of them are endocrinological active. 42% producing ACTH and 33% producing prolactin and 6% producing growth hormone and only 12% were hormone inactive. And the latency period is also interesting. It's very variable. 
sometimes it is only a, a few months, sometimes a, a years. And if you see here, the metastasis can occur in the brain. Probably they go with the CSF and have um, dissemination, but sometimes they also go to bone liver, lymph nodes, ovary, heart, or the lung. And the latency period between adenoma metastasis and the prolactin producing tumors was a mean of 4.7 years, and in the ACTH producing lesions a longer nine years. But you see sometimes a few months and 18 years, so very variable. So what is the presentation? In the non-functioning carcinomas, of course, it's a mass effect, usually visual problems. And in the endocrine active tumors is the hormone over secretion. If you look to the MRI of the cellar lesion, we see this invasive macroadenoma, usually with supracellar extension, but in and also invasion of the cavernous sinus. And if you compare the imaging appearance of the metastasis with the original lesion, it's similar in the MRI. If you look at the histology, of course, we found increased number of mitotic figures, increased microvascular density, and of course, also an increased PI67 and the P53 staining. What is the treatment? Of course, the resection of the lesion is the most effective treatment. If you have a prolactin producing tumor, you can add dopamine, dopamine agonists and growth hormone producing tumors, somatostatin analogs, and frequently, of course, radiotherapy is added. And the chemotherapy so far is um, referred as to be disappointing. The prognosis is also dismal. The mean survival time is only two years with a range of a few months to eight years and only 66% survived less than one year. And if the metastases are distant, so prognosis is worse with one year survival. And if you have a craniospinal metastasis, then it's a little bit better with 2.6 years. There was a recommendation of the European Society of, of Endocrinology. They investigated uh, some studies with, which harbored one point, 106 patients and looked at the effectiveness of demosolomide treatment. And they have seen a positive effect in about half of the patient. And that's why they recommended demosolomide as a first line chemotherapy which seems to be effective. It's different to the previous trials with other chemotherapy. And they recommended to have a first evaluation after three cycles. And if you see it's not effective, of course, you stop the treatment with demosolomide. So another nice paper published in pituitary in 2018 about the non-functioning pituitary carcinomas. And it was a review of 38 patients. The mean age was 46 years. And it was a heterogeneous group of tumors histologically, but all have an absence of endocrine hypersecretion. So there were included null cell adenomas or silent tumors. And also there is a great variability between the occurrence of metastasis, sometimes less than one month, but going to up to 24 years. And they found that the metastasis had often more abnormal histological features than the primary tumors. So they found that the TI67 was increased in the later occurring metastasis compared to the original tumor. And if they found a shift in hormone secretion, that was a sign of malignant behavior the location of the metastasis was mostly intracranial, but also liver, bone, orbital, oral, lymph nodes, lung, kidney, so everywhere it can appear. But the dual metastasis were similar to meningiomas. And also they looked at the effectiveness of timotzolomide, and they found that the response rate was a little bit less with 37%. And the median survival ranged from one month to 18 years with a mean of eight months. So poor prognosis in these tumors. 
And I just want to present one case of, of my own experience. So I'm, I'm not a pituitary surgeon. I have just 387 surgical patients and only one pituitary carcinoma in the series. And the case was a 47 year old female. She complained about headache, fatigue and blurred vision. And the ophthalmology examination showed that there was a decreased visual acuity on the right eye, but not hemianopsia. And endocrinologically, she had a partial pituitary insufficiency. And then we had this image. You see there is a supracellar lesion. Here is the pituitary gland. And there was invasion of the cavernous sinus uh, on the right side. On the left side, it seems to be just not to be invaded, but just to be pushed laterally a little bit. And she presented in November uh, 2017. And if you see this lesion, of course, we make an extended transubaculum, transplanum approach to get access to the supracellar lesion. So at first, we open the cellar area, we resect the tumor, and it was a typical soft adenoma. Then we open here the arachnoid over the supracellar tumor part and we resect the tumor. Fortunately, the tumor was soft. Here you see the arachnoid plane, you can go around. Tumor is resected with curettes and suction. Here is normal, the normal gland pushed to the left side. And then we switch over to a 30 degree optic and then we mobilized the tumor, which was located on the frontal base, indenting the frontal lobe. Soft tumor, so it was easy to remove it. And later on, we switched to a 45 degree endoscope. You see the curved suction to get access to this lesion and the tumor, supracellar part of the tumor is removed. The post-op MRI, one day post-op shows a good resection of the tumor uh, in the cellar and supracellar part. Histology revealed it is a non-secreting, non-functioning pituitary anoma. You see PI67 very high, 40% overexpression of P53. So everything uh, is, uh, shows that it's an aggressive high-risk adenoma. Then six week post op, you see there's a nice resection. This is a stalk. This is a um, chiasm. And you see there is a tumor in the cavernous sinus on the right side. But she was doing well. And she underwent a fractionated stereotactic radiation 29 fractions, 1.8 gray, with 52.2 uh, grays in summary. And then nine months after surgery and after radiation, you see the tumor shrink down. So there is no obvious tumor remnant. And she was doing fine. She was doing well. One and a half year post-op shows a stable condition, no tumor recurrence. Everything looks very good. And she was normal regarding her symptoms. She had a good ophthalmological outcome and she does not require any substitution. And then 2.1 year after the first surgery, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and got chemotherapy. And 2.5 years after the first surgery, she complained about headache, but was neurological intact. MRI was performed and you see the huge lesion behind is, uh, the uh, C1, C2, looks like a foramen magnum meningioma enhancing but had no dur dura tail and it was very uncommon that a meningioma occurs in such a short time of course and if you look carefully <clears throat> at the images of 1.5 years we have overlooked and also the radiologists have overlooked that here is already a small lesion which is obviously <clears throat> caused by the dissemination of the adenoma, which was uh, apparent here, but after one year, you see this giant tumor. The question then, what is the best approach? You see the tumor is extending to the jugular tubercle on the uh, right side. 
but the tumor in the spinal canal is pushing spinal cord from left to right. So usually if you see this lesion, we would make a far lateral approach from the left, but then we would not reach this part of the tumor. So we suspected that it might be a pituitary a metastasis, so we just took a midline approach because we we hope that it will be a soft tumor. See this, the arachnoid is intact, so we make a removal of C2, C1 and of the suboccipital bone, and you see this is a typical, it's the same tumor what we have seen in the, in the nasal surgery. So we dissect the arachnoid and the tumor was encasing everything. It went around the vessels, around the nerves, but the arachnoid was preserved so we could dissect the tumor. And you see it's very soft, it was suckable. <clears throat> and that was a good thing, so we could dissect it from the cranial nerves because this arachnoid layer was intact. It was not infiltrating, but just encasing everything. So we dissect here the nerves spinal accessory nerve from the tumor. Then the hypoglossal fibers came <clears throat> into view. But this could be resected with traction counter traction technique, two forceps. We could preserve all the nerves. And then the dura is coagulated was pretty clear that's an adenoma. Sharp dissection in between the cranial nerves to get everything out. And then we came to the other side, now to the left side where the tumor is pushing the cord to the right. And then we make an incision of the tumor capsule and arachnoid. And then again, our luck was that the tumor was really soft. <clears throat> so we could mobilize the tumor under the spinal cord and resected simply by suction and micro dissector. Soft tumor. Of course, the surgery was done under monitoring, of course. MEPs and SSEPs, and everything remained stable during the resection because the soft tumor. You see the good plane and we can take it out. And now we have a problem to look down below the, uh, <clears throat> the spinal cord. So we take a 45 degree endoscope and you see there is a small, small layer on the cord, which was not visible. And then this is removed. And finally, it seems to be a gross total resection. You see the pier is preserved. And then the histology shows it's the same tumor, ki 67 40% overexpression of P53 metastasis. So this is by definition a pituitary carcinoma. Nine days post-op, she was good. She had no neurological pro problems. She did not require substitution so far. And this once one month after the surgery, you see good resection, no obvious tumor remnant. And then she went underwent radiation therapy because the, the likelihood to get a recurrence is very high. You have seen how everything was encased. And six months after the surgery, the second surgery was doing well. And then she later came and has here some hyperintensity lesions, non-enhancing, looks like fat. Although we did not put fat anywhere, you see this here. Six months after the second surgery, it disappeared on one side spontaneously. And now the last MRI was 10 months after the second surgery. It um, disappeared completely. And so far, she's doing fine. But of course, we have to wait for another recurrence somewhere. So the conclusion is that pituitary carcinoma are rare lesions. The, by definition, there has to be a distant metastasis. Otherwise, it's just an aggressive adenoma. And the treatment options are surgery, radiation, dimosolomide, but still they have a poor prognosis. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Henry, for uh, giving us the opportunity to see this uh, very interesting case and uh, how you handle it.
So it's no time to question. I see in the chat box that there are a question uh, maybe for Luigi about the CSF leakage management. Someone asked if you use for giant uh, tumor a lumbar drain. I know your response. <laughs> and also if uh, you will keep the patient uh, at rest. So maybe I, I let you give you the opportunity to speak about your free F technique. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you know the answer. Of course, we don't use any more lumbar drainage, even uh, in giant adenoma, especially if we operate, um, if uh, there is no opening of the subarachnoid space, but also when we do extended approach, uh, we just put a piece of fat covered by nasoceptor flat, and we try to mobilize the patient the day after surgery. Ju this just to reduce the pressure of the uh, skull base defect. This is something we are using uh, since the last three years and uh, seems to give better results, especially if uh, we compare to the period of time in which we were using the lumbar drainage. I have also a question uh, to you, Luigi. Uh, when you are performing an extended approach, is the position of the chiasm influencing your decision? I will I'll speak mainly about prefix chiasm. Are you looking for that preoperatively or not? Will, will it change your management or not? Yeah, very important, especially if you deal with some uh, recurrent tumor. Sometimes uh, you can see that the chiasm collapses inside the cell and can obliterate your surgical corridor. So sometimes you can uh, even uh, have to avoid the endonasal root when uh, you have the chiasm which projects downward inside the cell. So of course we have to check for the chiasm, but if the chiasm is just uh, prefixed and the tumor is growing uh, below the chiasm and behind the chiasm, that, uh, like for chronic pharyngeum, is not a contraindication. Mm -hmm. Is there any question from one of you? I have a question maybe for the Lausanne stream. When you, you operate an unconventional tumor, how are you handling the fact that you will just make a biopsy and not a resection? Are you waiting for the intraoperative diagnosis made by the pathologist in order to continue your surgery or why are you dealing with that? Yes, in general, if we have a suspicion that it is an unusual tumor, we send a, a fresh piece for the pathologist to do an intraoperative uh, exam. And then we continue the resection until one week of the results. And according to that, we, uh, we continue the surgery or we stop it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there any other question or comment of one of you? No. <laughs> What's the proportion of the transcranial approaches in your centers? Very limited number of cases? Yeah, in this last 10 years, I performed four transcranial approaches. It represents uh, maybe 2%. Uh, yeah, 2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very rare. Yeah. We had also the problem with the larger tumors. We had three cases where we resect the tumor in the cellar space, and then it was a dumbbell shaped, and we could not get the upper part because the diaphragma was collapsing, and then it was very unsafe. In one case, I did not expect it was too much. In the other pay, two cases, I, I, I recognize there is significant tumor there. And then we thought we come back next day or uh, some days later, but in the night it hemorrhaged and they presented with hydrocephalus. And then we used a ventricular scope, went to the lateral ventricle and then we resected the tumor by the endoscope. Yeah, for giant pituitary adenoma, I think uh, the true limitation is the diaphragm. When we perform extended approach, I think it's very important to expose 
the supradiaphragmatic uh, region and uh, to cut the diaphragm, uh, it's very really important to mobilize the tumor and to reach uh, this uh, difficult part. Because if you go, uh, if you want to, to go supradiaphragmatic and you have a, a thickened diaphragm, it's very really difficult to reach this superior part. That's why transtubercular approach and uh, cutting the diaphragm is very important in dumbbell shaped tumor. I yes. Think. Is there any other comment or question? Our experience in the last eight years, minimum 150 procedure, we performed only one craniotomy. And because the tumor was completely asymmetric and posterior the CBN fissure, it was impossible. And in our experience, it's important the shape of tumor. And it's very difficult to dissect the tumor in front of the complex A1, A2, because if the tumor are growing posteriorly to optic pathway and push up the, the A1, A2 complex, it's more easy. It's not important the dimension. Maybe it's more difficult to remove a two centimeter of adenoma that's growing frontally, because we are not covered by the optic chiasm, the optic uh, the uh, complex A1, A2 and become very, very difficult. Conversely, when the tumor growing inside the third ventricle, you, sh uh, you follow the tumor. And we be honest, the consistency is crucial. <laughs> so if, the, if you meet a very firm tumor, it's a complete another history. I completely agree the manage of the uh, uh, hematoma, post-surgical hematoma. It's, it's worse to remove hematoma than pituitary adenoma because the consistency of hematoma is very firm. Yeah, we train. Yeah. yeah, completely yeah. agree, Diego. And uh, what do you think in your experience, uh, if you have an hematoma after transphenoidal surgery, do you perform transcranial or you come back by transphenoidal? I choose when the hematoma is uh, subfrontally, I perform transcranial. It's enough, a very little hole frontally and you run in front of, uh, I, I don't perform the superorbital kiol, but craniotomy is, is very, very limited. Conversely, if the hematoma growing inside the third ventricle, I use the endoscope. You following the, the, the axis of the hematoma and tumor itself, the problem is very, very more, more difficult than the hematoma. Mahmoud, Diego, may I ask something? about the, the hematoma. If you operate a patient transphenoidally uh, with a standard approach, even in, in, if you do a large hematoma, a large um, adenoma, and you have a hematoma, in our experience, we, uh, we do surgery transphenoidally. We do not go transphenoidally for hematoma, especially if you have not entered the subarachnoid space because you have uh, the capsule of the tumor, which protects yourself. So if you already have the patient who had some worsening of the visual function, uh, in our experience, it's uh, far easier to debark the rest of the tumor uh, and uh, remove the blood clot transphenoidal instead of going transcranially and uh, try to dissect the capsule from the nerves, which are already compressed. And you risk to have a further worsening of the vision, at least on the same side of your transcranial approach, you have to consider this. Okay. I mean, what, what do you think? If you have operated the first time transphenoidally and you have some uh, uh, delayed hematoma, maybe it's uh, easier and faster to redo surgery transphenoidally again. What do you think? Henry also, Michael. Uh, yeah. I personally yeah. agree with you, Luigi, and uh, I will uh, be in favor of uh, a redo transphenoidal. But yeah. but uh, in my experience, the result was very unsat uh, unsatisfied in, uh, when I returned by transphenoidal. I did uh, transphenoidal in two cases, and uh, the tumor is uh, more harder than the first time. So but you can, uh, the second time, if you are uh, not able to remove uh, intracapsular, you can uh, 
and you you have shown that you can go extra capsular and dissect the capsule and the rest of the tumor. I mean, the first time standard approach, second time, if you are not able to remove the intracapsular the hematoma of the capsule, you can go extra capsular and try to dissect. The problem of this patient is that uh, uh, you have a sometimes dramatic worsening of the visual function and it is absolutely not easy to recover from that worsening. So the less, uh, the more you minimize the trauma on that nerve, the better you will have some chance to have uh, an improvement of the vision. And of course, the time is crucial. As soon as the patient starts to have some decrease of vision, very soon to have, you have to uh, take the patient in your eye. Because once he has lost the vision, at least in our experience, the recovery, it, it will be very, very low. Yeah, I understand your point. Uh, honestly, I never uh, tried uh, to go extra capsular, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's an option. Yeah, it's you, not have, because... you have to go an extra capsular because if you go intra capsular, the tumor is more harder and the result is more uh, bad and the time is very crucial. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It becomes harder because uh, the bleed inside the capsule. It's true, it's true. We had also several patients, they had the bleeding and you see the supracellar area where the tumor was is all filled with blood, but if they are clinically asymptomatic, we just leave it. And if you see them after three months, it's completely yeah. resolved. So only, I think it's only indicated if they have visual problems or if they have hydrocephalus. Yeah, yeah. In our cases, if the tumor remnant is within the third ventricle, then I would not come again from the nose. And now we come from above with an endoscope, transventricular. But if it's under the diaphragma, then of course you make it endonasally. That's an important point, Harry. The, the post-op uh, control you do to the patient, especially when you have a large tumor, because sometimes if you do an early post-op MRI or even a CT scan, you can find the same shape of the tumor because the system needs some time to prolapse downwards. So this is the reason why we stop it completely to do MRI, early MRI in, uh, in large uh, pituitary patient, but uh, I would say not pituitary case because uh, it's completely useless if the patient is uh, asymptomatic. With Luigi, and it could be dangerous because an early MRI or CT post op could be confusing for the clinician because it's important to check the visual uh, loss. That's crucial. Is the patient complaining visual loss? No loss time, redo, and without any doubt. And uh, probably I was uh, not clear. My first choice is endoscopic, but in case of subfrontal real hematoma, not infection of the residual tumor, subfrontal is, is need extended approach, transtuberculum transplant to control the hematoma. And in one case, it was very important, probably uh, uh, arterial bleeding at this very important uh, hematoma, and we choose in only case the frontal craniotomy, but it was very difficult. It was not complain, we just lost, but uh, common to uh, clinical condition of tension. <clears throat> it's completely different. We are yeah, hyperintention and not a visual loss. It's, it's a difficult, it's a different, sorry. Mahmoud, maybe I have a question for you. You have the opportunity to have a gamma knife in your center. And uh, by the way, give my best wishes to Marc Levivier. When uh, you are dealing with the pituitary tumor, uh, I know that for vestibular schwannomas, by sample, preoperatively, you plan to uh, leave a small remnant, a subtotal resection, and then make a radiosurgical procedure. I have you some comment about the combined uh, use of transphenoidal plus gamma knife for a residue or go, did you go transcranially for a remnant or do you choose select? Is it preoperatively defined? Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mikhail, for this question. For pituitary adenoma, it's not like a, a vestibular schwannoma. We don't planify to combine a surgery between surgery and uh, gamma knife. You go to, to do cross-total resection. 
And if there is a residue, uh, it depends. If, uh, uh, if it's a, a non-functional pituitary adenoma, we can follow up. And uh, also it depends of the pathology. Uh, we use in uh, Lausanne to ask classification. If the tumor is classified in 2B, uh, in some cases, we can complete the treatment for intracavernous portion uh, by GK. For functional pituitary adenoma, we are more aggressive. We go for a complete resection. If it's not possible, of, if there is a small residue in the cavernous sinus, we can complete the treatment systematically by gamma knife. Thank you. Any other comment or question? So I think we will uh, end now this, uh, this webinar. I would like again to thank you for all your participation and uh, your involvement. Uh, you are very active in the activities of the school day session. Uh, I think this is the last episode of this, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, season i will say i was searching the words and the, the next season will start uh, in uh, september after the holidays i wish you nice holidays in the meantime and uh, we will build up again a very attractive program and uh, i'm uh, definitely sure that uh, we will continue our very active work uh, in the skill-based section with uh, all of you so thank you for your participation their friends, they're, they're all. Thank you very much. Always uh, a pleasure to be with you. And, uh, happy to see you. Bye. 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 Julia and Diego. Bye. See, you, Ciao, see you next time after the holidays. Have a nice holidays, all of you. Ciao. Bye bye.